article I did is called Neural Law Recognizing Opportunities and Challenges for Psychiatry. So um, there are three domains of neural law research. There's revision, assessment, and intervention. Um, and revision focuses on whether findings in neuroscience should lead to revisions of the law and legal practices. So an example of this is that they claim that neuroscience data shows free will is an illusion. And since free will is considered to be required for responsibility, no one should be held criminally responsible. And then assessment research focuses on the assessment of people and the mental state of the individuals. And lastly, intervention focuses on neuroscientific interventions. Um, and this domain of research is the least focused on out of the three. But the hope through this is that neuroscience will lead to treatment options that reduce the risk of criminals to reoffend. Re so one example that has been found through um, the neuroscientific interventions is using deep brain stimulation to reduce sex drive which can be applied in sexual offenders. So the psychiatric assessments of defendants and prisoners, the insanity defense has been considered the most plausible avenue by which neuroscience may contribute to the law. And in the coming years, in the coming years, neurotechniques may start to contribute to the diagnostic process in psychiatry. And this would be very helpful, especially since in forensic psychi psychiatric evaluations Feigning an illness is a serious risk, and generally the defendant's word cannot be taken for granted. And in the future, neuroimaging may be helpful to confirm or reject a psychiatric diagnosis or symptoms, like impulse control problems or command hallucinations. Neuroscience may also help predict future crimes. An essential aim in forensic psychiatry is to predict reoffending in mentally ill offenders. And neural prediction would be a helpful addition to the currently available risk assessment tools. And better risk assessment would lead to the release of many prisoners and patients who are not dangerous anymore, as well as to better prevent the crimes. And lastly, neuroscience may not only help to assess dangerousness, but also to identify domains that should be the focus of interventions to reduce recidivism in people with severe mental disorders. Um, and this would be extremely valuable, not just for patients, but also for the relatives and for society. So the challenges and risks of neural law. So there's over-enthusiasm and over-criticism. So for over-enthusiasm, there are serious limitations to the application of neuroscience in forensic psychiatry. And neuroscience usually concerns a group level, whereas in criminal law, the concern is on the individual, the defendant. And um, an example is reduced Prefrontal gray matter volume may be related to antisocial personality disorder at a group level. But what does this mean for the individual defendant who happens to have somewhat reduced gray matter volume? Um, and for overcriticism, neuroscience is such an enormous and multifaceted endeavor that we should be open to its possible contributions to forensic psychiatry. And current assessments and decision making in forensic psychiatry are often far from perfect. Diagnostic processes, treatments, and risk predictions are clearly in need of improvement, but this overcriticism may have a serious consequence, and that is that psychiatrists will not be involved in neural law advancements. So in conclusion, um, in the near future, neuroscience may support forensic psych psychiatric diagnosis, prediction, and intervention. This possibility should be taken very seriously, which means that it should neither be received with overcriticism nor with overenthusiasm. And the chance of success will increase if psychiatrists actively participate in the development. And here's my work.